few years back, my wife and I bought an old Victorian home in upstate New York. It was a beautiful property with an amazing landscape all around it. So when our realtor took us to see it, we had no choice but to fall in love with the place. It was not in our plans to get an old fixer upper, but sometimes the character of an older home outweighs the appeal of a big box cookie cutter home that we see popping up everywhere today. We got all the paperwork done to purchase the home in the next couple of weeks, and we moved in at the start of the month. That month happened to be December, and we were super excited to decorate our home for Christmas. The movers came and we got settled in within the first couple of days. We got the house decorated and sat by the fireside the first couple of nights, just enjoying the ambiance of our new place. Like the past few evenings, after a few glasses of wine, I would put out the fire and then we would head up to bed. I'm the kind of person who always has to get up at least once during the night to use the bathroom. I had woken up at some ungodly hour and began to make my way to the restroom. It was dark as heck and I still didn't know the place well, so it was a little spooky to say the least. I made it to the restroom and did my business, then headed back down the hall towards our bedroom. And all was well until I heard a sound coming from downstairs. It was just loud enough to make me freeze in my tracks and listen intently for anything else. The staircase that led downstairs was long and also had two turns in it, so it was impossible to see what caused it. The sound was faint, but it was still enough to startle me. But after a few seconds of silence, I chalked it up to being just an old house, and then I began to head back towards my bedroom again. Not even three steps later, I hear glass shatter. Then again, and again, multiple impacts of glass hitting the floor and shattering could now be heard bouncing off of every wall in the house. My wife called for me as she ran out of our bedroom and into the hallway. I was standing there frozen, looking at the stairwell. She must could see the fear in my eyes because she started to cry immediately. Everything was happening so fast. After about 30 seconds of the heinous noise, it went back to silent again. I slowly made my way over to the staircase. I had to see what the hell was going on down there. My wife was whispering as loudly as she could, telling me to come back. But I couldn't. I had to guard the fort, and it seemed I had done a piss poor job so far. When I rounded the final bend of that stairway, and the entrance foyer came into view, I was met with a horrible sight. Our beautiful 12-foot Christmas tree that me and my wife had decorated was in shambles. Every bulb and every ornament was scattered across the floor. Not one, not two, but all the ornaments and bulbs. I called for my wife and she came running down the stairs and was lost as I was on how this could have happened. Someone had to be in here, I thought, so I told my wife to throw on some clothes so we could wait outside while the cops were called. When the cops arrived, they did a full search of the place. They found all the doors and windows to still be locked, except the front one in which we exited in our escape. They also found no signs of a squatter or anything like that living in the home without our knowledge. You folks are all clear to go back inside, the officer said. Have you ever seen anything like this? I asked the cop as he started to walk back over to his cop car. He yelled back over to me. No, never seen anything like it. But it is an old home. Maybe you got yourself a ghost. I grew up in a small town in rural Pennsylvania. A lot of people in my area work on farms or with livestock in some sort of way. For me, it wouldn't be any different, so when I turned 14, I started to help out at my Uncle Paul's Christmas tree farm. I absolutely loved it and couldn't wait for my mom to drop me off there on the weekends. My uncle and his wife never had kids, so they would always be happy to have me over. They would put me to work doing different chores around the farm, teaching me responsibility, also putting some money in my pocket. I worked on the farm year-round, and the closer it got to Christmas, the busier it got with all the cutting down of the trees and setting them up on the roadside lot. 
He also had axes and saws available for those people who wanted to go out and cut down a tree on their own. The first Saturday in December will be the annual tree lighting ceremony out front of the farm. There is a big fir tree out there by the road that him and his wife would elaborately decorate. The first Saturday in December, people would come and shop for their Christmas trees, and then he would light up his once the sun went down. I still remember the smell of all the fresh warm apple cider in the air, and the glorious scent being around all those fresh cut Christmas trees. Before you know it, that day came, and we were super busy as usual. People from nearby towns poured in, having gotten their trees from him for years. I was in charge of escorting different groups out onto the property to the different types of trees they were looking to cut down. The land spanned a couple acres, but I knew it well from all the time spent there. It had gotten dark and things had begun to slow down. The lighting ceremony had happened and everybody was congregated around the front of the farm, admiring the tree, laughing and drinking. An old truck pulls onto the gravel parking area. A middle-aged man got out with a giant black beard and long scraggly hair. Is it too late to cut down a tree, he yelled out, walking over towards the group where my uncle was standing. My uncle looked up at him and just stared. I had never seen him not be his usual fun, friendly self, but something was different now. My uncle called back over to him and said, I told you not to come around these parts no more, Jerry. I'm thinking like, oh crap. They know each other. You owe me, Paul. Don't forget that. I'm always welcome, the guy with the black beard said. I don't owe you a damn thing, my uncle hollered back, taking a few steps towards the man. Our business has been settled for years now, so you can get the hell on out of here. My uncle was beat red in the face. I had never seen him this upset in my life. The small crowd had become quiet as they watched the altercation take place. I looked over to my aunt, and she looked very nervous, which was also strange because she usually carried a very bubbly demeanor. The guy Jerry took a few steps closer to my uncle. You know, Paul, he says, this is the exact kind of reaction I thought I'd get from you. Well, that's too bad, he said, looking my uncle dead in the eyes. I was standing off to the side about 30 feet watching all of this unfold. I went from a sense of uncertainty to fear for what was going to happen next. Suddenly before my eyes, I watched as the man drew a giant revolver from his jacket, pointed it at my uncle, and pulled the trigger. It sounded as if a cannon had went off, and just like that, my uncle fell to the ground. I stood there in shock, not believing what I just saw. I just stared forward at the scene until the sounds of piercing screams could be heard coming from the crowd and especially my aunt. I snapped out of my trance and seen the guy who shot my uncle casually turn around and walk back towards his truck. He jumped in it and sped out of the parking lot with gravel kicking up everywhere. I looked back over to where my uncle had fallen. The crowd was gathered around and my aunt was lying over his body, calling out his name. But even I knew at my young age that that pool of blood that surrounded him was way too much to lose. My uncle had died. The police were called and they soon arrived with the medics. That was the last year my family owned that Christmas tree farm. My aunt said she couldn't handle the farm on her own and she ended up selling. I thought she could because she was a strong lady, but I think the thought of her husband bleeding out in her arms on the front lawn was all too much for her to handle. I still think of the good times back on the Christmas tree farm, even now in my 40s, though I must say, Christmas has not been the same since. Every year, Christmas dinner is held at my house. My spouse and I love to cook, and we are blessed to have a big enough place to where we can host a nice family dinner. Altogether in total, it's usually about 20 of us, from our two kids to my parents, the in-laws, and the list goes on. 
A few years back, we would invite everybody over as usual, and things went as planned. Great food and conversation. My daughter invited one of her friends that year, who didn't have a place to go for the holiday. I was completely fine with that. They had been good friends for a while, and I know all too well the extra sad feeling of being alone for the holidays. With all the family sitting around the dinner table, the doorbell rings. My daughter looks at her phone, then excuses herself to go get the door. A minute later, my daughter walks back into the dining area, followed by Morgan and a rather burnt-out-looking young man. Dad, you remember Morgan, she said, and she brought her boyfriend with her. His name is Josh. I stood up to welcome them and then went to get a couple extra chairs so that they could have a seat. I wasn't the biggest fan of having this random guy around my family, but what was I going to do now? My daughter walked into the kitchen as I was grabbing the extra chairs. Sorry, Dad, I didn't know she was bringing him. It's fine, I said, as long as he's cool. Carrying on with dinner, every now and then I would glance down the table to our daughter's guest. The guy didn't seem to be talking much and had started to sweat a lot. I glanced over to the thermostat and it was set to 72 degrees, so I know it couldn't have been that. I kept my eye on him over the next few minutes and I kid you not, this guy was literally starting to doze off at the dinner table. Morgan would hit his arm and he would come back to life, and then seconds later, dozed off again. He slowly started to lean forward, then back. This guy had to be on drugs, I thought. I am a retired firefighter, and I have seen my fair share of stuff in the field. Josh then gets up from the table, looks at my daughter and says, where's the bathroom? I was barely even able to make out what he was saying. My daughter says she will show him and she walks him down the hallway to our restroom. I look at Morgan now that they are gone and she was looking down at her plate, clearly embarrassed at her situation. My daughter ran back into the dining room just moments later. Dad, you gotta come quick. Morgan's boyfriend was on my bathroom floor foaming at the mouth, seizing up. This man had overdosed. I yelled down the hall for someone to dial 911. Morgan ran down the hall and then began crying uncontrollably at the sight. All my other guests were in shock as well that this all was going down right now. Sadly, by the time the paramedics arrived, Josh had already taken his last breath. Everybody headed out after that. We had to cut the annual Christmas celebration short. His funeral was held a week later and my daughter went to pay her respects. She told me that she had found out that he had overdosed on fentanyl. Things were strange in our home for a while after that incident. When someone dies in a house, the energy seems to shift. Thank you all for tuning in to the very first Christmas special. This is the Spooky Moose here. I want to wish everybody a very happy holidays. Thanks for the support. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And I hope Santa brings you everything you want. Good night.